All right, welcome back. Today we are going to be talking about arrays, which are basically collections of things. So we're going to be talking about those and how we can use those in our programs and why arrays would be useful. And so a very brief example of what we're going to be learning today about why it's useful is, check this out, I got a simple little program here. We're going to look at this in detail later on. But notice how I have this variable here. This is the only thing I need you to care about at the moment. We'll, we'll break the rest of it down later. But I have this variable called numballs. And if I press play here, you'll see the number of balls I have are three. And that makes sense just you know logically because I have numballs is equal to three. Okay, that's cool. You know, big whoop. But check it out. If I come in here and say make numballs equal to, let's say, five, press play. Now I have five. There's five that's generated, and they're moving around doing their ball thing. What if I come in here and say 50? Do that, press play. There you go. <laughs> I got 50 of them just bouncing around, having a good time. It actually looks pretty cool. Um, and again, let's just have some fun. Let's do 1,000. Ooh, maybe not that much, not 5,100. Forget your 1,000. Let's just do 1,000. <laughs> and there it goes. Um, you see it's so much, it's actually logging or lagging, uh, processing down a little bit. Um, it's... It's, it's, it's struggling. You know, it can't keep up at 30 frames a second when it's got to handle so much. But you can see what's really cool and powerful here is that whatever I change this number to, I get that number or that amount of balls bouncing around my screen, which is actually really cool and, and pretty awesome. And so um, let's talk about you know, how we, we can make that happen in our programs, and that is, is going to be using something called arrays. And so what is an array conceptually? Well, an array is just a collection of things. Right, so you can think of it as a, a bucket of things, a basket of things. You know, it's just a collection of different types of things. Now, what types of things can be put into an array? You may ask. Well, if we just think about what types of things exist in processing and programming in general. We well, we have ints, we have floats, boolean strings, those types of things. Uh, those are all things we can put into an array. We also have, if you remember from the classes lecture. Uh, we can also make our own types of things ourselves. Uh, we call these things classes. We can make our own species, our own classes of things, and they allow us to, of course, you know, do fun things. Um, but that's our own type of thing that we even have made, right? So, like in this example here, I've made a, a thing called ball. So I have a class called ball. What I can do is actually make an array that holds a collection of things, but in this case, a collection of balls. And so, you know, any type of thing that you have in, in processing and programming, you can store that type of thing in an array. Now, one thing I want to note here is that an array can only hold one type of thing at a time. So you can have an array that holds ints, but if it's holding integers, it can only hold integers. It cannot also hold booleans or strings or something along with the integers. It can only hold one thing at a time. It can hold as many integers as you want. So it can have 20 or 100 or a million integers. Um, but you cannot have an integer and a, a boolean, let's say. So you can store any type of thing in an array, but once that array is holding a certain type of thing, it can only have that type. So if it has a float in it, it can only have floats in it. It cannot have booleans or any other type. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and so, yeah. So you may be wondering, though, okay, we're talking about this. Why do we care? <laughs> Why do we want to use arrays and stuff like that? Well, let's say I came to you and said, hey, Mr. Programmer person, please will you uh, draw 10 stars for me on the screen, right? Maybe you have a star class already, so you just got to type out, you know, make the stars, declare them, and position them, and render them, and all that good stuff. Okay, well, you know how to do that uh, if you've been through the class uh, assignment. But what you would have to do is, first off, you have to do this, which is 10 lines of code of just you making 10 stars, star, 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 star. Okay, it's a bit annoying and tedious. Uh, but then after that, you need 10 more lines of code saying, okay, for each star, like star 1.render, star 2.render, star 3, you know, whatever your display function is called, you got to do that for all of them. And uh, I mean, at this point in time, it just sucks. And that's only with 10 stars. If I asked you to do 100 or 1,000, it's just too much crap to worry about. Like, you know, it's so, so tedious, it wouldn't be worth it, right? And, you know, we want to fix this, right? And so we need to think about this general workflow we've been doing in this course. Uh, what we've been doing is, you know, maybe we start off, we start off hard coding something, right? You hard code something and, uh, you know, it doesn't, it works. Like, and this will work too. Like, just doing everything manually with the stars it would work. You'd see all the stars. Um, but it's a lot of work and it's tedious a little bit. 
But then we tend to learn a new tool, and then this new tool will help us, you know, make things easier on ourselves in the long run. And so we're going to continue along that path by learning about this new tool. And this new tool is, of course, arrays. It will help us with this problem. And so let's talk about arrays. Um, something I do want to point out is that an array is its own thing. And so what I mean by that is I have an, an example, an analogy here. And so let's say I have these two apples, and I call this apple, apple one. I call this apple here with the green leaf, apple two. You can think of these as variables, right? Where the variable name is apple one and the value is this first apple. And apple two variable has a value of this apple, right? So I have variables that's equal to individual apples. Cool. Now let's say I have an array. Now I can set arrays also to be equal to a variable. So I can have a, an array saved as a variable in my program. Um, so let's say I have that here. So I have a bag of apples, right? What, what's a bag of apples? Well, it's a collection of things. So we can think of a bag of apples as an array. Now, this can also have a variable name. In this case, we're going to call it bag of apples. That's the variable name. But the value is an array, which is a collection of apples. Now, notice here that even though this is a collection of apples, it is distinct from any individual apple. So a bag of apples is different from Apple 1 or Apple 2. And so even if Apple 1 and Apple 2 are inside this bag of apples, there are still separate things, right? So you want to think of your array, the, especially the variable that you know is saving this array, it's going to be a separate thing. It's distinct from any individual thing that may be inside of that array. So I think that's very useful to think about and just keep in mind. So I wanted to point that out to you. Now, let's talk about how we actually make arrays. How do we make a collection of things in our program? Well, if we look at this example here, this should look very familiar to you. This is how we make a variable in processing or Java. And so, you know, what's the different parts of this? Well, we have the type, we have the name, and then it's equal to some value. You initialize it to some value. Well, we can do the same or similar thing with an array. And so actually, this line of code here would actually would make an array. And so if I look at this, the first thing you do if you're making a variable is you initialize it. Or excuse me, you give it a type. You give it a type, right? Um, this is declaring it. You give it a type. Well, same thing if we're going to make an array. We also need to give it a type. And so what we need to do is give it a type. So let's say I want to make an array that stores integers. It's a collection of things. In this case, it's a collection of integers. What I can do is, or what I need to do, is give it a type by saying int, just like the variable. Except I also need these two brackets here. Nothing should be inside of them, um, but I need these brackets here. Whenever you write these brackets after a type, this is you telling processing, you're saying, hey, this thing here is going to be an array. And so th these brackets point that out to you. They say, hey, this thing's going to be an array. Now, what type of thing is this array going to store? Well, it's going to store ints. So the type here, if I'm going to do a variable, I just say int. For an array, same type of thing. If I'm storing ints, I put int. But I need to have these empty brackets here to let processing know that this variable is going to be an array. Okay. So that's how you do the type. For the name, nothing weird there. You know, for this variable, I just named it x, and I was good to go. Same thing for the array. You just put the name. Um, I, would, I tend to have the name of my array somehow let me know when I read it that it's an array. And so one simple way to do that is just to have the word array <laughs> at the end of the name, right? So then it's obvious that, hey, whatever this thing is, it's going to be an array. Um, but what I've also done is like, uh, let's say you have an array of bubbles, right? Um, a collection of bubbles. What you can call the array is just bubbles with the S, S to make it plural. And so that makes it very natural when you read it. You can say, hey, there's, this is a collection of bubbles, right? And so just whatever you name the array, I recommend that you name it something to kind of uh, give you a hint that it's a, an array itself. But again, you can name it whatever you want. If you want to name it Billy Bob or, you know, uh, Bob Dylan or whatever you want to call it, some just silly name, you can. Um, I don't recommend that at all because that's bad code. It's, and then if you read it later yourself, you don't understand what it's doing. You have to do a lot of work just to figure it out. So it's... It's bad practice, but theoretically, you can name this whatever you want. I recommend that you name it something that, you know, gives you a hint about what it does. But nothing weird there. Just like with the variable, you just name it. Now, to give it a value, you have the equal sign, just like you're used to. 
But it's a collection of things, right? How do we uh, symbolize a collection of things in, in writing the code? What's the syntax of it? Well, what you need is these two curly braces. You're in the past, and in most things in processing in Java, the curly braces represent a block of code. So like an if statement or a for loop or a function. You know, it's, it's like a section of code that you have kind of blocked off. Uh, that's not really the case here for an array. In this case, the curly braces represent, in, in this case, the first curly braces curly brace represents the beginning of the array. The second curly brace represents the end of the array. So anything between these curly braces is going to be located inside this array. Um, but in this case, then you just list whatever it is you want in the array. And so these commas here separate the different elements of the array. So this array has four things in it. The first thing it has is the number one right here. The second thing it has is number four. The third thing is a negative two. Fourth thing is a five. And I separate those out by putting commas. And that's, that's it. That's how you, uh, you give a value to your array. Um, in this case, I'm manually writing out what should be in this array. That's why I called my array in this example manual array, because I'm manually telling it what should be in that array, uh, which at times can work. Um, however, there's a problem about doing this. Um, and so what's the problem with this? And you know, it's not a real, it's not a huge problem. Like this would work. We will not yell at you. Code would run just fine. But the problem that I have with this is that if we think back to when I was talking about the stars here, or the star example, you know, what was the problem with this? Well, the problem is that it's really tedious. You gotta type everything out, right? You gotta be very explicit and type everything out. It's a lot of work. Well, the thing is, about manually typing out your array using these curly brackets, which again, it works. But the problem is that you're still manually typing everything out. You know, we haven't gained too much here um, in terms of filling the array. Um, at times, you still want to do this. There are times where that's completely appropriate. But I also want to talk about what are some quicker ways that we can kind of access every slot in the array. So if we want to fill the array, it's really quick to fill it in. Or let's say you want to do everything or do something with everything in the array. So maybe if it's like the, uh, the ball example, maybe you want to render every ball. What's a quick way for us to access every ball in the array and then, you know, render it? And so that's what we're going to talk about next. And again, I just have this little slide here. The reason we want to go about this instead of manually typing everything out is because, what, you know, you might have heard this before, but what is a, a quality that all great programmers have? Well, the quality is that they're lazy, right? And, you know, what I mean by that isn't that they're just a bunch of lazy bums who never do anything. What I mean is that they're lazy like in the long run, where in the long run they want to do the least amount of work possible. And so to do that, what do you have to do? Well, you have to kind of work smart, right? Uh, and so you have to, to do things. You don't do unnecessary work, basically, right? And so if there's a smarter way to do the work where it means you could do less work in the long run, that's what you want to do. And so you have a little quote here. You know, Bill Gates said, I will always choose a lazy person to do a difficult job because he will find an easy way to do it. And so that's what we want to do. We want to be lazy people, not because we don't want to do any work, but because we want to find the easiest way to do things. And so... That's what we're going to talk about next. What's the easiest way we can do things with loops without having to manually write out every little thing? And so let's go ahead and talk about that. This first thing, uh, this first little picture here, uh, you've seen this before. This is me manually making my array. I want to talk about a different way of doing this. And this will allow me to fill the array much quicker and easier. Okay. And so I'm going to do that here in the second example. I call this one fill array. And you see, it's very similar in the sense that when I give it a type, I still have the word int. It's going to be an array that stores int. Empty brackets. This is me telling processing. It's going to be an array. I called it fill array because I'm going to fill it in some special way that you'll see here in a second. But instead of saying equal to, and then my curly brackets with me manually saying and explicitly saying everything that's in the array, instead what I do is I say equals new int and then bracket with a number. Um, so let's break that down. You always have to have new whenever you do it this way. Just like a class, you just put the word new because you're making a new array. And then this thing, where I have int, this should just match whatever this is. So if I'm storing things of type float, this would be float. This should be float as well. If I'm storing things of type ball, this should be ball. This should be ball as well. So on and so forth. Now these curly brackets here, they have a number in them. What this number represents is the number of slots I want in my array. 
So if I want an array with 10 slots, so I can store 10 things in my array, I need to have the number 10 here. If I want to store 100 things in my array, where you know there's going to be 100 elements inside my array, I need to have 100 in that position. So whatever number you have in that position, that is going to it's going to make this array have that amount of slots. Now at this point in time, even though it, it what this does, it makes an array called fill array, and it gives it in this example 10 slots. So it gives it the number of slots, but I have not put anything in those slots yet, right? I have not like right here when I manually did the array. In the first slot, it has number one. In the second slot, it has number four. You know, I, I have explicit values in there. But in this method, I have not yet put anything in my array. I've not told it what should be in the array. I've just given it some slots, right? I should also point out that you tend to do this bit of code in your global space. So before you set up function, before you draw, it's in your global space. You just make a variable and... Um, you, you give it the number of slots. But at this point, it's not initialized yet. It's only declared. It's, only, it's not initialized. And so we will later start putting values in for this. All righty. Let's clean that up. Cool. Continuing on. So let's talk about now how we actually fill it with values, right? Um, to do that, I want to first talk about how we can discuss the positions in an array. And so the reason I want to talk about, you know, a way for us to, to discuss positions in an array is because if we think about it, if we have an array of balls or bubbles or something, and I want to do something with every, with, let's say for ball, for every ball in that array, I want to do something to it, I need to be able to access every particular ball. Or let's say I only want to do something with one specific ball. Maybe there's something special about the fifth ball in that array, and I want to do something with it. I want to make it larger or something. Um, I need to be able to access specifically the fifth thing in that array. Uh, to be able to do that, we need to, of course, be able to discuss how we can talk about positions in an array. So that's what this slide is about, and it's going to be focusing on indices, or the index of a position in the array. All the index is, is a position, right? Um, so so let, let, let's talk about that, right? And so if I told you um, what what's, what position, so I have a picture of an array here. Um, what's the thing, in, or what's, what's the first position? Well, you'd say, this is the first position, right? You'd say that's the first thing. Um, so you might would say that it has a position of one, right? I think that's how most people would think about it. And that's a natural way to think about it. However, in programming and in computer science, we think about it a little bit different, just a little bit. Um, because we say that the first thing in the array has an index of zero. So that's what this little box is saying. So we don't start off by saying position one, position two, position three, position four. We don't do that in programming and computer science. We start off by saying that the first thing has a position of zero. The second thing has a position of one, third thing has a position of two. So you go up from there, right? Um, there's reasons for this. This actually makes some things easier for us to program later on. Um, but what you just need to remember is that for an array, the first thing has an index of zero. And then it goes up from there. So again, the second thing is an index of one, third thing index of two, fourth thing index of three, so on and so forth. So that's just, you got to keep that in mind. And so let's, uh, let's look at an example here. <clears throat> so I have uh, an array. Right? It has one, two, three, seven things in it. I want to say there's, for every array, there's two things you can talk about. There's the value of a certain thing in the array, and there's the index of that thing. So if I look at just this first thing in the array, well, what's the index? Well, the index is zero, because it's the first thing. So index starts at zero. If it's the first thing, it has an index of zero. But what's the value of this thing? Well, the value is three. That's the thing itself that's being stored in the array, right? If I go back to the Apple example, the value would be Apple 1, or the value would be Apple 2. So the value is different from the index. The index is like the position. The value is the thing that's actually stored in the array. And so if I come to you and say, okay, well, what's the value of the thing with the index of 4? Okay, 
Let's just look at it. Index of 4, well, that is this thing. What's the value of that thing? Well, it's 5. And so that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, for everything in the array, it has a value and it has an index. The value is kind of the thing itself, right? Uh, the index is just a position. So that always has the same order, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up until forever. All righty. And so, uh, yeah, so let's say I want to actually start filling my array. Well, the way I can do that is with a line of code like this. So, you know, if I go back just a couple slides, you know, I've made an array at this point called fill array, right? Um, so I've declared it, but remember, at this point in time, I have not filled the array with anything. So now I want to start filling it. What I can do is I can say something like fill array bracket zero equals five. Looking at this, this thing between the brackets is the index. The index. Index. I'm really slow writing with my little, with my mouse here. I don't have a stylus, but that's the index. And then it's equal to this thing here. This is the value. Value. I'm just going to put val for short. The value. So what I'm doing here is I'm telling processing, hey, you know fill array, that thing you declare, but you didn't fill with any values yet? What I want you to do is for the thing with the index of zero, the slot with an index of zero, put the value five in that slot. Same thing. This line right here says, hey, processing, for the array fill array, for the slot with an index of three, put a 10 in there. Give it a value of 10. And so that's what that does. That's what these lines of code does. So let's uh, let's look at this some more in a little example. I'm going to step off to the side here. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Step off to the side. Have a little example here. Uh, let's go do this together from scratch. And so uh, let's say I have, I want to make my array. So uh, an array of integers, I'm going to call it fill array. So to make, to declare my array, I need to give it a type. Well, it's going to store things of type int, so I'm going to put int. But because it's an array, I'm going to put some brackets here. Then I'm going to give it a name. For now, I'm just going to call it, or I'm going to call it my array. It's going to be equal to uh, a new, it's a new array holding ints. And how many th slots do I want in it? I'm going to start with 10 for right now. Okay. Now, I'm going to teach you a, a new little thing here. There's a, we've talked about print and print line and those functions. You know, they print things down here in the console. There's also a print array function. So if you put an array here, it would actually print out that array where it tells us the index of every slot and the value of every slot. So if I press play here, we can take a look at this. You see here on the console, here's our stuff. The things in the bracket here are the indices, and the thing next to it in this other column is the value. You see that for every slot, it has a value of zero. That's because when I declare an array right here, an array of ints, the default thing it puts in there is zeros. And so that's what we're seeing here. You know, Just by default, it filled with zeros, but I have not actually told it any values yet. So we want to change that. And so let's say I want to make this first slot, the thing with the index zero, give it a value of five, let's say. What I could say is my array bracket zero. So this is referencing the slot with an index of zero. So it's going to be this first slot here. For this first slot, I'm going to put a five in that slot. I'm going to give that slot a value of five. If you press play again, we print this out. You'll see that here is my array. The slot with an index of zero has a value of five. So awesome. We're good to go. I love it. And so, uh, you know, let's mess with this more. If I want to say my array thing with index 5, make it equal to negative 6. Ooh, you know, negative numbers now. Um, press play on this. Let's see what happens. You'll see, again, uh, index of 0 has a value 5. That's what that line did. But then the slot with an index of 5, that's this one right here, has a value of negative 6. Awesome. And so you can see we can actually kind of access or we can assign values to different slots in the array by using this format with the array name, bracket, 
with whatever you want your index to be between those brackets is equal to whatever value you want. What we can also do, so this is us assigning values to the array. We can also access things in the array. So I'm going to do that by just saying print line. Let's say I want to know the value of the thing uh, in the slot with index of 5. I just want to know what value the slot with index 5 is. I can say print line my array bracket, put whatever index I'm, I'm interested in, in this case index of 5, you know, print that out. It's going to say, okay, uh, well, the thing, the value of the slot with the index of, of 5 is negative 6. And so that makes sense because I told it to be that. If I say, you know, 4, it gives me 0 because, remember, I didn't give it a value there, so the default value was 0. I can print the whole array as well, so we can take a look at that too. You can see the thing at the, the slot with index 4, so this one, has a value of 0, and that's what we're, we're being printed out as well. And so hopefully that makes sense. Um, we're actually going to use this concept, this structure here of using the array, bracket index is equal to value. We're going to use that to quickly fill our arrays, but also to allow us to access everything in the array. And so um, let's talk about that coming up next. And so what we want to talk about now is how we can fill these arrays in a much quicker fashion. And we're going to use loops to do this, specifically for loops. And so let's talk about that. And so before we do, though, um, there's another concept I want to run by you is this dot length method. So let's say you have an array, right? Um, it's called ball array. It can be called whatever you want, right? But for this example, mine's going to be called ball array. If I say ball array dot length, that actually gives me the length of that array. So if there's 10 slots in ball array, if I call ball array dot length, it's going to give me the number 10. If I have 100 slots in ball array, ball array dot length is going to give me 100. So this dot length, it will give you the, the total number of slots in an array. So this is going to be very useful for us. So now, what we covered so far is we have made it where we declared our array. This is in the global space. So above your setup, above your draw, um, this just declares the array, right? Um, and remember, this number here is the number of slots you have, right? It can be a number. I, I'm using a variable in this example. You'll see in that other example in, here in a few minutes about why that's useful. But this has to be the... The length, basically, right? It's the total number of slots. So make sure you have this, of course. We've talked about this. But then, if you want to fill the array with a loop, you need a for loop like this. And so let's break this down. So we have a for loop. And just to review, there's three parts in the for loop. The first is a variable that you come up with. You have to declare and initialize it. So declaring it, that's why it says int to initialize if I have i equals zero. I will go ahead and tell you that for this for loop and for the array, i is going to represent the index. And in fact, if you want, it's not a bad idea to call your variable index if you want to. That's a very reasonable thing to do. Um, you can call it i for short, uh, but since i is often used in other kind of for loops, you can call this index if you think that's more appropriate. That's totally it's a very smart thing to do. Um, but that's the first thing. So we need to initialize and declare a variable. This variable is going to be used to tell us whether we should keep looping or not, right? The second thing in the for loop is a Boolean expression. It's a condition. Um, it's going to be true or false, right? If it's true, we keep looping. Once it turns false, we stop looping, right? And so you can see this says, while i is less than ball array dot length, this is where we use that dot length, while i is less than the length, keep looping. In other words, before we reach the end of the array, keep looping. And then this final thing just says what should happen to i to this variable. Um, at the end of every iteration, this says make an increase by 1. And so what does this all mean? What this all means is that this for loop is going to loop for the same amount of number as there are slots in the array. So if there are 10 slots in the array, this loop is going to iterate 10 times. If there's 50 slots in the array, this loop's going to iterate 50 times. That's what using this dot length does for us, and by having this overall structure. 
So this is useful. We have a loop that will actually go through our, our array for once for every slot that it has. Okay. Well, we can use this method then to fill every slot in the array by saying this right here, where I have my array name. I call mine ball array bracket i. Remember, i is like the index here, right? So i is kind of like the index. So this is saying for the the slot with an index of i in ball array, put a new ball in that slot. Give the value of that slot a ball. And since this loop loops once for every slot in the array, it's going to fill every slot in the array with a new ball. Pretty cool. And that makes sense because if we think at how to do this step by step, i starts off at zero. Well, ball array bracket zero is the first thing in the array, right? The, the first slot has an index of zero. So then it says, okay, well, since i is zero, fill the first slot with a new ball. And then it goes back. Let's assume this condition is still true. It increases i by one. So then it does it again. And then ball array with index of one. Give that slot a new ball. Well, that's the second one. It's going to keep going until it reaches the end of that array. By the end of this, the entire array is going to be filled with, uh, in this case, new balls. So this actually allows us to very quickly and very easily fill the entire array with balls. Or with, that, with whatever value you want to. In, in my case, I'm just filling it with objects of the ball class. And that's really cool because that means if the size of the ball changed to be 100, 500, to 6, to a million, whatever, no matter what the size is, this is going to fill the entire array with balls. So that's very, very powerful for us. It means we don't have to do all this work. You know, if I have like a thing with 10 balls and it's going, and then you come to me and say, Chris, that's cool, but I wanted to see a thousand. I don't have to then copy and paste my code over and over and over again. All I have to do is change the length of my ball array, and then this loop handles the rest for me. So it's beautiful. It's elegant. It's, ah, so good. It makes us really powerful. It makes things easy on us, which is really cool. And so that's great. This fills the array for us, but that by itself is not useful, right? We have to, um, of course, use our array, right? Or well, what's the point if we don't actually use it for anything? And so let's talk about that, and then we'll go to my uh, example. And so here is me using it. So this is for my ball array, right? Let's say I want to render and move and do all the good things with uh, every ball that's in my array. Well, for, for one, I would usually do this in my draw, right? So this probably this loop's probably in my draw because you want to do this every frame. That's, that keeps the balls moving every frame, right? But if you look at the for loop, like this bit right here, notice that this is exactly the same as the one we just talked about. That's because what do we want to do here? Well, we want to loop through the entire array, just like we did when we filled it. So this, nothing's different here for the for loop. And then... The difference is, though, between these two curly brackets, instead of assigning values into the array, we are now accessing values. And we're doing different things with those values. So what are we doing? Well, we're saying for the slot with the index of i, you know, whatever that thing is, in this case it's a ball, render it. For the thing in the i slot of the array, move it. For the thing with the i slot, uh, wall detect it. And what does this for loop do? It goes through the whole array. So that means for every ball in the array, it's going to be rendered, it's going to be moved, it's going to be wall detected. And that does everything we want for our, for our balls. And so this is really, really powerful for us. It gives us a lot of control because what does it allow us to do? What allows us to do what I showed you earlier in this example, it allowed me to, if I press play here, see there's five balls right now, but this allows me to, by changing one number, this, this variable right here, numballs, when I press play, I now have 50, like that. No extra work on my part, I just change one number. So it's very powerful, it's super cool. So, let's look at this then. What do I do in this example? Well, I have a variable for the number of balls. I do that. I then go ahead and declare... My array, we talked about that. This is before my setup, so it's in this global space. I'm making a global variable. How do I do that? Well, I have the type. I have my empty brackets. This is me telling processing this is an array. I have the name. You can name it whatever you want. It's equal to a new, I have the type again. 
brackets, and then you have some kind of number here, right? This is the total number of slots in the array. <clears throat> in my case, I'm using a variable. That's this variable right here that I'm changing. So that just makes it where it's easy for me to find and easy for me to change, right? And then what's cool, <clears throat> ooh, excuse me, but then here in my setup, you can look at this for loop here. What does it do? It loops the whole array, like we talked about, but it makes every slot in the array equal to a new ball. So I have an array, you know, I set the size with num balls, and then that whole array is filled with different balls. You know, remember this constructor is like a birthing function, and it does random stuff. Random X, random color, all that good stuff, right? So cool. Then in my draw, I have another for loop. It goes through the whole array again, but it says for every item in that array, render it, move it, and wall detect it. So every ball is rendered, move and wall detected, which results in this action right here. So it's very cool. It's very powerful. And um, I want to say, if, you, if, you, if you're at this point in the course, and if you mastered classes, and you mastered arrays, the world's your oyster, man. You can do anything that you want because not only, you know, I think fundamentally in pr programming, if you have if statements and loops and data types and things, you can theoretically do anything, but it'd be really, really hard, right? But once you have functions, once you have uh, classes and arrays, the world really is your oyster. And so, uh, yeah, that being said, I hope this was helpful to you, and uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you so much.